Hey folks, today we'll be continuing this series on the classics and we'll be discussing Willem Steinitz, who was the first official world champion after defeating Johannes Zuckertort in a match in 1886. So to me, Steinitz is a really interesting player because he kind of represents the transition from the Romantic era of chess, which the series has largely been focused on, to the Classical era, where positional understanding and positional features became much more important and had a much bigger role in chess. Steinitz came up during the heyday of Morphy and Anderson, and much like others, he was a really strong attacking player, and a lot of his earlier games and later games as well featured some really, really beautiful attacks and combinations. Uh, for instance, in our first example in this video, here Steinitz is playing against uh, Mongre Dien, and he has a, a nice development here with white, and rather than castling, he actually just immediately goes for the attack here with h4. And this is a pretty strong attacking plan. The point is basically to push h5, open up white's rook on the h-file, uh, eventually bring the knight to g5, and basically target black's king. The game continued knight d7, h5, c5, h6, g6. Uh, now if black recaptures with the pawn, the h-file will be opened up, and eventually white can play a potential move like bishop h6 and challenge black on the h-file. So black took with the knight, White decided to castle, a6, knight g5, knight f6, and here comes a really nice combination. Uh, I think Stein has basically calculated this one all the way until the end. So white starts with knight takes h7, black is forced to take back, and now rook takes h7. So investing a whole rook into the attack, king takes h7 was played, queen h5 check, king g8. Now white could already grab this knight on g6 and win back some material. But instead, Steinitz first starts with rook h1, which I think is better, uh, immediately threatening queen h7 mate. Black has to play rook to e8. Now white took on g6, and the f7 pawn is hanging. Black had to play queen to f6, and I'm pretty sure that white had anticipated the, uh, the last finish here in order to win the game, because queen h7 check, king f8, this would actually not be so clear, but much stronger is bishop takes f7 check. Black is forced to play queen takes f7, and after rook h8, white wins using this nice tactic. The king is uh, pushed away from the queen, white goes queen takes f7, and materially speaking, white is doing great with the queen and a couple pawns. Uh, black's pieces are all under attack, and the king is still really exposed, so white is just completely winning here, and black resigned. So despite a lot of nice attacking games like this one, at a certain point, Steinitz decided to shift away from focusing on attacking play and rather more on positional features in the game, such as controlling the center and making sure that his position had no weaknesses, while in turn trying to provoke his opponent into making weaknesses that he could later exploit. Steinitz basically believed that chess was a balanced game and that an attack that starts right from the opening generally should not be successful if the opponent hasn't made any mistakes. And an attack that's kind of started before one is ready is kind of a mistake in itself. And so as black, he believed in accepting gambits and trying to punish players who would try to attack uh, too frivolously. One game that I really liked was Steinitz's win against uh, Sam Rosenthal uh, in Vienna in 1873. Here Steinitz was playing black in the position and White had just played the move f4 and kind of advancing in the center. Uh, and here Steinitz does a great job of fighting for counterplay. He starts with the move knight a5, hitting White's bishop. White goes back bishop to d3, and now d5. Uh, a really strong move, striking back in the center and basically fighting for central control. Now, if White were to push e5, this would run into pretty serious problems after the move c5. And here, Black is ready to advance d4, and it looks like White is probably going to be losing a piece. So, White is forced to take on d5. Now, Black takes back, Knight takes d5. And it turns out that White's f4 pawn is actually pretty weak here. It would much rather just be on f2, or it could help uh, defend White's position. Instead, white plays knight takes d5, queen takes d5, and now black just has a very healthy and active position, trying to play moves like c5, b6, bringing the bishop to b7, as well as moves like knight to c4 and bringing the rooks to the center. The game continued c3, rook to d8, threatening a potential c5. White played queen c2, knight c4, bishop takes c4, and queen takes c4. White was kind of forced to give up the bishop here, as after bishop f2, I think c5 would be quite awkward for white, 
uh, would have to play bishop e4, queen to d6, and now the knight is hanging, the f4 pawn is hanging, and in general, white's position looks pretty suspicious here. So after knight c4, white gave up the light squared bishop, black played queen takes c4, and now Steinitz was able to use the advantage of the two bishops uh, quite nicely here. Queen f2, c5, pushing the knight back, b6, and after knight e5, black did not panic, did not give back one of the bishops, just plays queen e6 and backs up. Queen f3, bishop a6, rook e1, and f6, kicking white's knight away from the e5 square at the cost of blocking the bishop on g7, but this is very temporary. The bishop will eventually be released into the game and black will have a great position. Uh, black played h5 here, knight f2, queen f7, f5, and just g5. Again, not panicking, keeping control over the position, and it seems like white has made some progress on the king side, but that's not really the case as black's pawns are basically controlling all of the squares here. The queen on f7 is nicely defending h5, and basically white has no way of really attacking here. Uh, so Steinitz ended up growing his advantage uh, larger and larger um, here with rook d5. Queen takes d5, and all of a sudden it turned out that white did not have a good way of defending this f5 pawn. He picked it up and slowly won the game. Steinitz also believed in the power of the king, and uh, one of the openings that's named after him is a really interesting variation in the king's gambit. Uh, here after e4, e5, knight c3, knight c6, this is Steinitz's game against uh, Louis Paulson, which is probably one of the most uh, famous examples of Steinitz's love for the strength of his king. Um, here he goes f4. This is, uh, of course, known as the Vienna game, but kind of transposes into King's Gambit territory after e takes f4. Uh, and here white plays d4. So this move looks absolutely natural, but since white has not played knight f3 yet, black has the option of playing queen h4 check, which Paulson certainly takes up. And here comes Steinitz's idea. After the move king e2, it looks like white has played uh, terribly here and the king is uh, really, really exposed. But in fact, the power of the center here is really not to be underestimated. White's next move is going to be knight f3. Eventually, he's going to try to pick up the f4 pawn. And if white is able to hold on to his strong pawns in the center, well, the safety of the king is not going to be an issue. White is just going to be in total control. So black tries to keep the initiative going here with d6, knight f3, bishop g4. Uh, but ultimately is not really able to achieve much. White takes on f4, castles, and now king e3, another truly fantastic move, uh, basically unpinning the knight uh, and setting up this pin against the queen, but on the other hand, white is now threatening to take on h4, and this forces black to give up some ground with queen h5, bishop e2 is played, and now it's clear that white is going to be able to develop here, the king is heading back to f2, and once white gets his pieces out, again, he's just going to have a completely winning position uh, in this game. So Steinitz ended up winning this game in really nice fashion. If you guys want to play through the rest of it, there is a link to the Lee Chess study that I'm using in the description below, where you can find all my notes to this game, as well as all the other games that we've covered in this series, as well as some bonus games that I don't, I'm not able to get to uh, in the videos. Well, Steinitz was basically considered one of the best players in the 1860s and 1870s, uh, but he wasn't the official world champion uh, until he won a match against Johannes Zuckertort, another one of the top players from that time in 1886. Uh, now Zuckertort actually did really really well in their match. He won the first four out of five games, but ultimately he lacked a little bit of energy and as the match uh, dragged on, Steinitz kept winning more and more games and eventually emerged uh, victorious. One of the most interesting games from that match uh, was uh, took place in the following position where Steinitz was playing black. And uh, here it, it seems like things were about uh, balanced. Uh, material was equal and the main imbalance here is that white had this bishop against, uh, white had this knight against black's bishop on e8. And here, kind of like in typical Romantic era style, uh, Zuckertor started attacking with the move rook to e3. And it feels like a very natural move. The rook is going to be transferred either to g3 or h3, 
But the truth is, is that white actually doesn't have that many attackers on the king side. Black has a uh, few defenders, but more importantly, white has these pawns in the center on d4 and c4 uh, that are known as hanging pawns that will need to be defended. So if white starts making too many moves towards the king's attack and it doesn't pan out, well then eventually he's just not going to be able to defend his center. And that's kind of what happens in this game. So black starts with queen d6, simply putting pressure against the d4 pawn. White goes rook to d1, and now f6. A really important move, challenging white's knight on e5, and if the knight is forced to go back, then the bishop might come out to g6, and all of a sudden become a really active piece. So white goes rook h3, this is very consistent, hitting the h7 pawn, and it's extremely dangerous for black to take on e5 and allow queen takes h7, so Steinus just calmly plays h6, and he simply did not believe that white's attack is going to work here. Uh, white goes knight g4, once again intending to look for some kind of potential sacrifice like knight takes h6 or knight takes f6, but this is simply covered with queen f4. Very strong move, hitting the knight and also covering uh, both of these potential sacrifices. White plays knight to e3 here, and now comes bishop a4 and the counterattack has started. White has no real threats on the king side, but now black is starting to put a little bit of pressure hitting white's rook on d1, and the rook is forced to stay on the d-file in order to defend the d-pawn. White throws in rook f3, queen d6, rook d2, and now bishop c6, hitting white's rook on f3. Uh, now white really should have played the move d5 here, and I think after this move, the situation would not really be that clear. White definitely has enough attackers on the pawn to hold on to it. Probably black could play something like bishop to e8, and white is in a little bit of an unpleasant pin here. Black might follow up with something like bishop f7, uh, but ultimately this is what white needed to do. Instead, he played the move rook to g3, but now after f5, black is just taking control over the center and really the entire position. Uh, the bishop is helped along this diagonal. Black is also threatening uh, potentially to play f4 and win material, and this makes things very difficult for white's pieces. He goes rook g6, bishop e4, queen b3, king h7, and now this rook on g6 just seems completely misplaced. White has zero attack, and the rook uh, could be much more uh, needed on c1, for instance. Uh, white plays c5 here, but this runs into rook takes c5. I think he probably anticipated this because his idea was to play rook takes e6 here, uh, and this was the idea of opening up the queen with c5, but the tactics simply don't uh, work out for white. Uh, rook takes e6 was played, rook c1 check, knight to d1, and now it turns out that white's back rank is extremely weak, and Steinitz was able to win the game with some really nice tactics here. Queen f4, hitting the rook on d2, white plays queen b2, rook b1, queen c3, and now rook to c8. Uh, really nice deflection move, if queen takes c8 would be played, then after queen takes d2, White simply has no defense to these threats and no good counterplay uh, against the king on h7. Instead, white tried rook takes e4, uh, which is a, a decent move, but the problem is after queen takes e4, black is again threatening a uh, back rank mate, and white is simply lost as the queen is hanging, the back rank is hanging, uh, rook c1 is coming, and there's just no defense to all of the threats. So it was games like this that allowed Steinitz to become world champion, although some commentators believe that Steinitz was the effective world champion from way before then this match took place in 1886, as he had already defeated Anderson in a match back in 1866, and he also defeated players like Henry Bird, as well as Zuckertort in a previous match in the 1870s. So I would say that Steinitz's main contribution uh, was this transition to a more universal style style of chess where uh, players would attack not just for the sake of attacking but because their position was specifically good and they had ultimately some reason to launch an attack. If not, Stein has believed then that the defender ultimately should be able to defend against any early attacks. Steinitz ended up defending his title against a very strong Russian player, Mikhail Shigorin, who will definitely be featured in this series later on, and then ended up losing the title to a young Emmanuel Lasker in the 1890s. By then, Steinitz was, of course, getting older and no longer considered the world's best player uh, in comparison to the new crop of younger players like Lasker, Shigorin, Tarash, Yanowski, and, and others.
Of course, I'd be remiss not to share with you guys one of Steinitz's most famous uh, games slash combinations, perhaps his most famous one. Uh, this took place against Kurt von Bartleben uh, in 1895, uh, when Steinitz was uh, already the reigning world champion. And in this position, playing white, um, he clearly already has uh, an advantage in terms of development, but if he allows black some time here to continue uh, playing, black would play king f7, rook e8, and get his king out of the center and castle by hand. Of course, right now, castling would not be possible as this would hang the knight on e7. Now, for those of you that have already seen this game a million times, you're welcome to just <laughs> skip ahead to the end of the video. Um, but for those that haven't, I would really encourage you uh, watching this game as it's really really a uh, fantastic effort so here white plays d5 already a very strong move sacrificing a pawn just to build the initiative the pawn cannot really be taken with the queen in view of queen takes e7 mates knight takes d5 is of course impossible so black is kind of forced to play c takes d5 and now white plays knight d4 which is kind of the point of his pawn sacrifice in order to improve the power of his knight now the knight is heading to d4 and then e6, where it will be a very, very strong piece. So black continues his plan with king f7, knight e6, and rook hc8, trying to challenge white on the c-file and stopping the threat of rook c7, which existed in the previous position. Uh, here Steinitz goes queen g4, hitting the g7 pawn, black plays g6, and it's basically here that white's combination uh, starts as the forcing moves uh, are basically all forced from here. Uh, Steinitz plays knight g5 check, king to e8, but here is where white's brilliancy uh, really starts to take place, and Steinitz plays the very famous, now very well-known move, rook takes e7. So really just a fantastic move, but I would say the, the brilliancy of this combination is not that the move itself is so startling, but the fact that black's best defense is just as interesting <laughs> and just as fantastic as white's move, rook takes e7. Now the first point I should uh, clarify here is that if queen takes e7, white will play rook takes c8 check and win material. After queen takes c8, black is forced to block and go into a losing endgame where white has an extra knight on the board. If black was to take the rook with the king, here white just develops a winning attack starting with the move rook to e1 check and now black's king has to stay in contact with the queen, and there are different winning lines here. For instance, if black goes king d6, white will play queen b4 check, king c7, and knight e6. Rook e7 was already good enough, just winning the queen, but I think knight e6 is much stronger. Uh, after king b8, queen f4 check, the king is just getting mated on this side of the board. Rook c7 takes, takes, and rook e8 mate. This was just one sample line, but basically black's king was uh, not going to be able to get out. Uh, if king d8, then again, knight e6 is already very good. Um, but the key question is, what happens after black's move in the game, king to f8? Really just a fantastic defensive resource leaving the queen just hanging on d7 to, to so many things, but opening up a counterattack against white's rook on c1, which is actually going to be a back rank mate. So if white plays rook takes d7 or queen takes d7 in this position, he just gets mated with rook takes c1. And of course, this is exactly the type of move that players often miss when they're playing out their combinations. We typically expect our opponents to accept the sacrifice, but king f8 is truly a fantastic try. And now what to do? Things are actually not that simple because white's queen on g4 is also hanging. So if white backs up with the rook or moves this rook over to e1, then black will play uh, queen takes g4 and just have a winning position. So it turns out that white's rook, knight, queen, and rook on c1 are all hanging. It seems like black might even be winning, but white has a fantastic continuation rook f7 check. Now if black plays queen takes f7, with the idea that knight takes f7 is not a check and black will be able to mate white with rook takes c1. White instead will play rook takes c8 check. And then after rook takes c8, queen takes c8, white is again going to be a piece up and just have a completely winning position. Instead, black plays the move king to g8, again walking uh, away from the rook. King e8 would not work as then white is taking black's queen with checkmate. So king g8 is played. Once again, everything in white's position is hanging. The queen on d7 is untouchable in view of back rank mate. Steinitz continues with the really fantastic rook g7 check. The rook just continues its way along the seventh rank. Uh, 
Now, if king takes g7, white is picking up the queen on d7 with check, which means black is not in time to take on c1, and, and white is totally winning. And again, if queen takes g7, this allows white to pick up the rook on c8 with check and end up with an extra piece. So, of course, black continues king h8. Uh, instead, if king f8, then white would win with a really nice idea, knight takes h7 check, forcing the king either to e8 or to take g7, and then there's going to be uh, white winning the queen with check. King e8, there's knight takes f6. So black goes king h8. Next move is probably pretty simple to guess. Rook takes h7 check, king to g8. And now the white has picked up the h7 pawn. The h file is now open. Steinitz goes back, rook to g7 check. So as the rumor goes, uh, Steinitz opponent here uh, resigned at some point uh, in disgust and <laughs> left the tournament room. And uh, Steinitz then had to demonstrate the force mate to uh, spectators. Back then it was pretty common to announce force mates and then demonstrate them if, if the opponent didn't play it out. Um, here after the move king to h8, white wins with queen h4 check. Uh, finally forcing black to take this rook on g7. Uh, and then after queen h7 check, black's king ends up getting mated with uh, white's queen, knight, and rook all participating. Uh, queen h8 check, for example, king e7, queen g7. Uh, the king tries to run away, white's, king, white's queen just slowly approaches. Queen f7 check. Um, here, if king d8, this was kind of the main line. If king d6, simply queen takes f6, uh, followed by queen e6, queen takes e6 mate. And then after king to d8, white wins with queen f8 check, queen e8, knight f7 check, king d7, and queen d6. Really pretty mate to finish things off. So in, in my view, this is one of the absolute best games in chess history. I think uh, chess players should know the game or at least the combination, I would say, uh, by heart. And it really started off with a fantastic, I would call it a positional sacrifice, d5, uh, opening up the d4 square for white's knight and really f facilitating the power of white's attack. Uh, but of course, this entire combination, starting with knight g5 check, and then of course, rook takes e7, followed by the rook's dance along the 7th rank. This is just amazing, and I, I think one of the best combinations uh, in chess history. With that, we'll be wrapping up the video here. Once again, if you enjoyed it, please leave it a, a thumbs up and, and comment below. And if you'd like to check out all the games from this video, uh, as well as the previous games in the series, do make sure to check out the Lee Chess Study that's linked in the description below. Hope you guys have a good one, and I'll see you next time. Take care.